My name is Sharon Biswas, and today I'm going to talk about sex and analog games, a marriage, or how analog games can enhance our discussions about sexuality in a way that um, other kinds of games might find it difficult. Um, so very quickly, I'm an independent game designer. I also write about games a lot. Uh, I'm organizing this big project uh, about um, erotic interactive fiction and discussing sex in different ways. Um, just to say that I'm coming from this more as an artist and practitioner uh, and less of a scholar. So my specific lens is, is more of a creative. Um, but uh, let's talk about sex now. Um, in games. Now, I want to start with this quote from Lizzie Stark. Uh, we tell high fantasy tales of bravery and daring do. We tell stories about backstabbing vampires and we tell stories about the demon Cthulhu rising to consume us all. We do not the quiet moments where relationships start to fall apart. We play battles, not sex, right? So games tend to talk about different kinds of conflict and not as much about romance and sexuality. Now, Again, nothing wrong with showing these kinds of conflict, just that it's kind of a shame um, and it's kind of a missed opportunity that games, out of all the other modes of art, uh, tend to underrepresent this topic, sexuality, that is so important to us as humans, right? It closes down ways of discussing this that we could be using. And that, of course, is important for us at QGCon because queer people around the world are, in one sense, marginalized marginalized precisely because of who and how they have sex, so who they have sex with and how they do it, right? And so by expanding these conversations, by analyzing sexuality uh, in different ways through different artistic lenses, uh, we might be able to expand our conception of queerness and marginalization that way. So games don't tend to talk about sex, right? Except that in some ways, they do, right? Um, teens often engage in these games that have this transgressive sexual sort of play, right? Spin the Bottle, where it's about kissing, um, Seven Minutes in Heaven, which is about various things you can do in a closet or far from prying eyes, right? So th we do at a, a, a young age in certain cultures, of course, um, have these games that are about sexuality. And then... Uh, our sexual activities often have elements of games, or at least play in them, right? Here in this essay, um, Sifonin and Har Harvianian um, talk about how BDSM, um, advanced BDM se BDSM sessions in turn, have also obviously borrowed elements from live action role playing, whether explicitly or just by similarity, right? So. Um, certain elements of our sexuality have game-like elements to it, or at least playful elements to it. So there is something about games, play, and sexuality that we already know, but when we talk about um, published games, or games as products, or mainstream games, that sort of thing is somehow lost. Now notice, uh, both these examples I just gave were very um, uh, pointedly about analog games. They were less so about digital games, right? Um, and, and one could argue that digital games don't represent sex uh, as well as they could in the in the current form or in the current um, zeitgeist, one could say, right? So here we have Mass Effect and Dragon Age, which are basically dating simulators, one in space, one in the fantasy world. I joke. Um, but, uh, but these two games embody what a lot of games do in that they have sex as this very transactional thing, right? Where um, you build enough points by giving enough presents or saying the right things in dialogue, and you build relationship with someone, then you can unlock this sex scene. See, there's like a pinnacle of your uh, relationship with this character, right? And Paolo Pettuccini has noted that in some ways, this might be inescapable in the way we deal uh, with video games and computation in general, right? He says, from the eyes of a computing machine, something, everything is mathematically defined and susceptible to rational calculation. Not only time or money, but also natural resources, love, anger, fate, descent. There's nothing that hasn't been formalized in a game, has not been turned into a variable, end quote. Um, so, uh, Paolo Pedricini says that it, video games themselves make it difficult to not have sex and 
romance as this transactional exchange of resources. Analog on the games, on the other hand, have the ability to offer a, a rather more nuanced portrayal of, uh, of human emotions, right? They help us to break out of what Pedercini calls the rationalist aesthetic that is inherent in video games. An analog game, such as Emily Care Boss's Romance Trilogy, um, allow us to uh, to um, uh, to do what uh, what Cal Jones spoke about in her talk at the Living Games Conference, where sex should mean something. It can mean different things in different games, but it should mean something. And of course, she means more than just a transaction, because of course that means something too. But analog games allow us, at the current state of our technology and the way we deal with deal with technology, um, to make sex mean different things, to make the, the human, the squishy, the soft things come to the forefront and not just an exchange of power, right? Uh, and so um, analog games have a number of affordances that can help with this. Um, uh, first off, uh, analog games... Um, make you embody the action. I'm using the definition of embodiment by Meyer et al. in their paper Embodiment in Social Psychology, which is uh, embodiment is the assumptions that thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are grounded in sensory experiences and bodily states, right? So physically doing things um, can influence the mental state. This has uh, been a, a principle in many different artistic fields. So in, in theater, for example, V.E. Meyer Holt had this idea of biomechanics, quote, if the tip of the nose works, the whole body works, end quote, where actors would do physical things to, Im to bring about emotion, right? And so in analog games, by um, by using the body, by manipulating pieces, by manipulating the body, by physically talking and interacting with others, you can create emotional states that might be more difficult to do um, via digital avatars alone, right? And these things, um, since sex and sexuality is rooted in the body in some sense, right? Not entirely, of course, um, not even, maybe not even in the majority, but in, 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 in parts of it, uh, rooted in the body. So one can imagine that, uh, that using embodied play, using games that have embodied actions or procedures, uh, you can get to these ideas of sexuality in a way that's very different uh, from video games, right? Um, there's also the idea of social reinforcement. In role-playing games and, and games where many people are present in the physical space, uh, you can cue off of each other, you can look for social reinforcement. Jessica Hammer et al. in their chapter in the role-playing game studies, a transmedia approach book, um, um, uh, talk about a number of these uh, social aspects of games that are, that are they, they talk specifically about uh, child development and how a, a lot of these uh, social cues, uh, symbol, uh, ref uh, reinforcing of symbolic understanding, uh, social referencing, how a lot of these help children um, develop social cues. But I would argue that this is probably extendable to adults as well, where we can build on these social competencies through this analog play. Um, then there's the idea of alibi, and this should be fairly familiar to uh, many of the audience here. Uh, the idea of the magic circle, where once you enter the magic circle, the rules of the game uh, sometimes become different and important in different ways. Or in Ma Mary Flanagan talks about in her book Critical Play, where uh, people are likely in a game to push up the boundaries of what's allowed, right? Um, the idea of alibi um, is where uh, people in uh, analog games, especially role-playing games, um, adopt a different persona and sometimes will allow themselves to take action that they might not allow themselves to in their real persona. For example, playing a different gender um, is one. Um, Hammer in the same Jessica Hammer in the same chapter notes that adolescents can often use uh, role playing to navigate their own social identities when they're forming their identities. And of course, it's not just adolescents who are forming identities. Adults also need to, are constantly forming and reforming their identities, right? So this idea of alibi, exploring various identities through play and role play uh, can be a very powerful um, way uh, of using um, analog role playing games, right? Um, so this idea of bleed is a consequence of some of these things I mentioned before. Um, so Sarah Lynn Bowman uh, uh, has a definition of bleed that I like to use uh, from an article in NordicLab.org, which is uh, when real life feelings, thoughts, relationships, and physical states spill over into their characters and vice versa. 
Um, so in role playing games, this is called bleed. So uh, this is when um, I, if I, if I have a friendship with someone in game, after the game, I continue to have these feelings of friendship, right? Or if I have a romance with someone in game, after the game, I'm a bit like, whoa, I'm still having interesting feelings. Let me process this, right? And and this can be very powerful if we are considering this emotional and social side of sex, right? Not just you know the transactional side of sex. Um, this can be very interesting. Again, related to the social enforcement we discussed earlier, um, to, to, to talk about what are the emotional consequences or stakes of sexuality and, 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 and games uh, that use bleed, that allow players to handle and manage bleed, um, can do this, can discuss sex in very interesting ways. And again, I argue this is much uh, easier in um, to achieve in analog games, digital games, precisely because of all these above things, because of alibi, because of social reinforcement, because of embodiment, all these things together allow for a rich experience of bleed that allow you to discuss uh, this very physical, emotional nature of sex in different ways. So all that is a quick summary about why I think analog games are particularly ripe um, for discussing sex and sexuality with players. Now, many analog games use these uh, techniques to do really interesting things sexuality, things that I haven't seen digital games really do. So, for example, um, Monster Hearts 2 by Avery Alder is very famous as like a queer game. And it does a lot of different things, but two things it does I think are important to note. So, first off, it explicitly lets people have sex, right? I mean, that's the basic way thing. But uh, in addition to letting people have sex, um, uh, Monster Hearts also encourages, through its mechanics, um, uh, encourages players to use the sex mechanics, right? When you, when your character has sex with another character, something happens. So Monster Hearts is a game where you play teenage monsters, like werewolves, witches, whatever, in a school. Um, and uh, when, let's say, the Fae character has sex with another player, uh, or another NPC even, uh, like, secrets and promises are shared, right? And so there is a story incentive for players to try sex mechanics and see, oh, the story will change, will be affected if I have sex in this game, right? And that is an interesting way of encouraging players to explore these mechanics, because very often players who are not used to this, because a lot of these games don't exist, might feel shy about this, right? Um, other things that Monster Heart does, there's a mechanic called turning someone on. So in this game, um, players have no control about who has the possibility of turning them on. It's kind of determined by dice. Um, and this is um, uh, to, to keep this idea of queerness and developing sexualities in adolescence, um, to keep that alive, where you aren't, you don't decide, I'm only going to be attracted to X gender or Y gender. You let the dice determine that and that might cause identity confusion or or what does that mean about your identity and for a game that's all about queer adolescent identity that can be very very powerful um, and I, I put these two games together because they both use the uh, idea of communication in interesting ways to talk about sex. So um, Consentical by Naomi Clark, which is on the left, um, is a really interesting game, which is a two-player game where one of you is, an, uh, is a human and one of you is this like tentacle alien and you're trying to have a pleasurable sexual encounter. And the game is all about, all about communication because it's all about like if I play this card and if they play this card those two will synergize and, and increase our like pleasure, right? It's all about like, what are they gonna play? What am I gonna play? Uh, do I think they're gonna play this? It's all about communicating to re your desires and your abilities because you have different abilities um, with your partner communicating to have the best outcome for both of you, right? And so um, this game uses like various kinds of communication, eyes, uh, speaking, um, um, sign language, there are various modes of difficulty the game uh, uses uh, and uses different kinds of communication uh, that, you know, will be difficult to uh, do through um, a digital game and uses this to talk about consent uh, in sex. Now, My Girl Sparrow um, is, is very different. It's a LARP uh, by T.K. Peterson. Um, and in My Girl Sparrow, um, the, the main, the game asks you to very explicitly describe sex scenes that you have with other characters, but not 
you, you are not allowed to describe internal thoughts and happenings. You're only allowed to describe what others can view. For example, if I'm in a, playing a sex scene with someone, um, uh, I would um, hold their hand. The holding the hand is important uh, to increase physical connection. And I would describe like, I uh, I am stroking your hand and I am kissing your face, right? Uh, and then if I want to convey emotion, I can only do so through the physical. So I can say, um, uh, my breathing starts to increase uh, rapidly. I cannot say I am getting excited, right? This game forces us to think about how we communicate about sex and how we talk about or don't talk about sex, where we talk about feelings in many ways, we sing about feelings all the time, but we are often shy in discussing the mechanics even uh, of sex. And so these games uh, use this human creativity uh, in a way uh, to, to talk about communication about sex in an interesting way. Um, this, is, this is a LARP called Just a Little Loving. Um, it's like a five-day LARP. It, it deals with the AIDS crisis in New York, uh, and it does a number of different things with sex and sexuality that are, that are very interesting. So for one, um, uh, when you want to engage another player uh, with, uh, in a sexual act, you hand them this pink feather, and if they accept it, uh, they have consented, and you can go off and, and go out of game, discuss what you're going to do, and then go back in game, right? So this idea of consent through this offering uh, is really important, and also kind of lovely. It's like a, literally a pink feather that's offered. Um, but another thing that I really like uh, that they do is uh, sex in this game is very physically embodied so uh, to show sex we have all these like pink dildos lying around the play space uh, which can be a whole campground um, and you like mime performing fellatio on it for example or you mime um, using um, uh, you mime like masturbating it or something right um, uh, so um, uh, in there, it forces you to think about what is this sex act I'm doing. And since it's a game about AIDS, you, if you want to have safe sex, you are applying condoms onto uh, this pink dildo, right? So it makes you do that as well. Uh, and it, it brings the physical to the forefront. Like, I'm doing this act. That makes me think certain things, especially when we talk about like disease. Um, and then the, the other thing the game does is, is at the end uh, of a sex scene, you have this post coital monologue where you each say uh, to the other what thought is going through your head once the sex is over. And that's really interesting because that shows that people have sex for all kinds of reasons, right? And and that reason can change while you're having sex. And so this game does that really well, again, in ways that, analog, uh, that digital game would have a difficulty doing. And then finally, uh, I was very fortunate to be involved in a project called Honey and Hot Wax. I was one of the co-editors. We got two grants to make this happen from the Effing Foundation um, to make analog games about sex and sexuality and published by Pelgrane Press, right? And there are eight games in the collection. Now I'm going to quickly talk about four of them uh, that do really interesting things in sex and sexuality, right? You Inside Us is a game for two players uh, where one of you is like a human on another planet and one of you is an alien symbiont who literally goes inside the human and takes residence inside their body, right? And the game is all about what does this alien find sensual and sexual? Is eating soup a much more sensual act? Is taking a shower a much more sensual act, right? And so this game, uh, if we're talking about like queerness, we're talking about different ways of conceiving of sexuality, uh, you inside us makes us think about what even is sex? Why are certain things considered sexual, sensual, erotic, intimate, and other things are not, right? Similarly, in the clefts of the rock, um, uh, which is by Lucian Khan, sorry, You Inside Us is by, by uh, Cap Jones uh, and Will Morningstar. Uh, so in the clefts of the rock by Lucian Khan um, is uh, a game where you are touching each other's bodies and while describing fantastic landscapes. So I might be uh, I might be stroking your knee and describing traveling through this like forest, right? And this game, I mean, there's more to it than that, obviously, but that's the core. This game asks us to examine the stories and fictions and truths we layer onto our bodies. And it also asks us, in a way, to decouple the physical and the mental, because uh, I could be like fondling someone's genitals in this game, but I'm describing describing like trekking through like an icy glacier for example right and so 
what does the physical act of me doing and the mental imagination, what do they have to do with each other? And what story am I layering onto someone's body, right? Which is very relevant to, to queer people. Like, what is my body? Especially, like, you know, people who uh, have different conceptions of gender that are outside the traditional gender conceptions that we've been taught to think about, right? Um, Pop uh, by, by, by um, Alex... Uh, I'm messing up the name um, by Alex um, um, is uh, is uh, a game where you play um, as people who are part of the balloon fetish subculture and you are communicating digitally except the game is an analog game so so Alex has introduced all these analog uh, ways of representing the digital right and the game's really interesting because um, Alex spent a lot of time doing research um, uh, and spent time with uh, with participants who are in the balloon fetish culture and Alex uh, asks us to conceive to think about what does it mean to be in a marginalized sexual subculture and have limited modes of communication, right? Um, by, through this, like, digital, quote, digital, end quote, right? Because you do it in an analog way. If I only have a digital outlet, how do I explore my sexuality? What happens when I finally meet up with someone? Because at the end of the game, you do meet up in, in real life, in the meet space uh, with someone. Uh, and then what does that mean if for this marginalized identity that I have? Again, it's really interesting. And then Pass the Sugar, Please by Cleo Yonsu Davis is, again, interesting. And it talks about communication again, where you're at a tea party. Uh, you find someone that you think you were at a BDSM sex party with last night. And you're trying to communicate with with them what what you enjoyed and didn't enjoy but because you're a tea party you have to say it cloaked in euphemism only talking about the tea and the food in front of you right and so this game forces you to think about how do i communicate uh this uh, and i ask you to interrogate the fact that interrogate the fact that why am i not actually communicating explicitly why do i not say um what i really feel right uh, and it makes you think about that and makes you play that so, uh, analog games, um, especially indie role-playing games, um, but not just, um, but these kinds of games have been interrogating, exploring, making us think about sex and sexuality in ways that most digital games have not, partially because, you know, they don't, they often don't have the bounds of the market, like I must sell a lot to, to, to make the video game worthwhile, um, but partially because analog games themselves have, um, affordances that, um, uh, allow this discussion to be uh, more nuanced and rich. Um, so I'm going to end uh, with this quote from Aaron Trammell and Emma Lee. Um, for anyone who's thinking of, of making these games, um, implementing uh, implementations of sexuality in games run the risk of transforming the sacred into the banal. And as such, they must be considered with care by both designers and players. So uh, when thinking about including sex in games, Take care, right? Uh, think about what you're doing, what the players are doing, what the intent is, because you don't want to turn, you know, the sacred into the banal or, or you know, turn into something that could be um, um, uh, triggering emotionally or, or, or could trigger trauma, things like that. So uh, ending with that, um, thank you. Uh, my name is Sharon Biswas. Um, um, those are my contact details. Um, Strange Lost, Strange Loves, an anthology of erotic interactive fiction is currently on Kickstarter. Check that out if that interests you. Uh, otherwise, I hope you enjoy the rest of QGCon.
So the title of my presentation is Loving Games, Loving Machines. This question of what does it mean to love a text is one that is essential for this presentation. One way of thinking about love for a text is through admiring how it uses language to cause the reader to feel an emotion. Uh, video games, for example, medium that is able to cause emotions that might lead a player to express love. But what happens if we conceptualize this love from the player as something erotic or romantic? And even more than that, we imagine the text as something capable of reciprocating that love. Is there something inherently queer in this idea of feeling love toward a video game? So the goal of my presentation is to explore how reader text relationships can be used to explore how digital and queer subjectivity intersect. So I want to start with Roland Barthes, who talks about how text can function as erotic objects that can autonomously express their desire toward a reader. I then move on to Jennifer Waldron, who provides examples from her study of early modern writers who characterize the theater as something that's autonomous and able to exert its will on the reader. After that, I will discuss an array of authors who have written on video games, queer existence, and the intersection between those two things, which will in turn provide a framework for considering the queerness of a reader-text relationship. And finally, I'll be looking at the Christine Love game Digital A Love Story from 2010. I'll explore how the queer reader text relationship plays out through the narrative and structure of a video game. We can conceive of a text not as an inert object, but as something that's capable of inducing effects in the reader. And Bart specifically discourages us from emphasizing the reader's humanity, their humanness, as the central requirement for producing pleasure. Rather, he says that the unpredictability of the reader's bliss is what offers the possibility of pleasure. He calls the text of pleasure, quote, the text that comes from culture and does not break with it, unquote, while the text of bliss, quote, imposes a state of loss and unsettles the reader's historical, cultural, and psychological assumptions, unquote. So we have this distinction between a text that works through established norms and produces pleasure and a text that is more unpredictable in its evocations and is capable of producing bliss. And for Bart, normative acts produce a pleasure that contain within them the potential for feelings that can come from a rupture from the normative. And so the feeling of repression what he says is it seduces the reader. And Bart, in this framework, describes the text as flirtatious. He claims that the text must prove that it desires the reader, which it does through, through writing, through language. And this, this description of the text as, as flirtatious and desirous frames it as something that's autonomous, something capable of effects that are beyond what the author has produced through the text itself. So not only can it act, but Bart also sees the text as a body, predominantly defined by its potential for this feeling of bliss from the erotic relations that it can create. So when the reader's body pursues the text's ideas, beyond the intention of the human ego itself, this has the potential to produce pleasure in the person who's reading. And not only that, but the text's status as fetish and as body provides the basis for an indeterminate relationship between it and the reader.
So to go back a little further, previous writers have considered how a different medium than the novel, theater, expresses desire toward the spectators who engage with it. So Jennifer Waldron describes how writers of the early modern period think of the theater as an object that possesses desires to which people have to submit. She writes, quote, the autonomy of the medium is imagined as its capacity to impose its desires on operators or spectators, submitting humans to the supposed will of a non-living object, unquote. The autonomy of the technological object, the theater, emerges through its ability to have desires that humans then have to respond to. So the theater renders the spectator immobile and unable to act upon their own desires. But when the spectator desires the theater, that immobility, that sense of captivation, becomes a way to fulfill human desire. So conceiving an autonomous theater means imagining an unwilling human subject rather than allowing for a subject who manifests their desire as captivation. So in the case where the human desires the media object, interacting with the object inherently fulfills the human's desire. So to express autonomy, the media object would then have to express a desire that goes against the human desire to engage with it, maybe through a mechanism that draws attention to its object status. So I've discussed this idea of autonomous text. I'm going to move now to talk a little bit about this notion of queer love and how it plays into wider notions of queer games. So one way of analyzing the desiring relation between a reader and a text is through the lens of queer love. And this is something that's discussed by David Halpern. So he writes, quote, one of love's most important social functions nowadays is to promote the acceptability of customary forms of personal life by endowing them with affective value and imbuing them with the look and feel of intrinsic normalcy, end quote. So love enables the normalization of heteronormative social relations by attaching emotions to the conducting of those relations. So traditional love rituals, which could be recognized as something that's highly constructed, instead are seen as necessary for the conduction of romantic love. So then love allows heteronormative coupling to function as part of the regular emotions of daily life. So Halperin describes love historically as a way for queer people to deny the abnormality of their queerness. But then a queer love would threaten the established forms of social life and functions in a socially inept way. Queer love tactically resists the standardization of emotions and structural entities like the school and the state that try to shape how people practice their love. And he uses Foucault's concept of counterconduct, which he defines as, quote, the struggle against the procedures implemented by various authorities for conducting others, end quote, as one way of thinking about how queer love works. The specific aspects of queer love that resist traditional social relations make it difficult to grasp for a society that's used to romantic norms. So then to go further into the concept of queer games themselves, someone like video game scholar Naomi Clark differentiates between two strands of queerness in games. There's finding queer representation in games and queering the structure of the games themselves. So Clark describes an instance in which a senior colleague asks how diverse creators benefit a game, to which she responds, quote, creators with marginalized experiences and subaltern viewpoints have a different capacity to make new kinds of games that we haven't even seen yet, that we hadn't even seen yet, 
end quote. She uses the example of an anaanthropy game that recontextualizes the relationship between creator and player as a dominant submissive relationship where the player performs tasks defined by the creator to achieve pleasure. So someone like Anthropy pushes the boundaries of what it means for a digital program to be a game. As Clark writes regarding her 2012 game Dysphoria, quote, if Anthropy had allowed player actions to determine the course of the game, the autobiographical fidelity would have become mutable and subject to player whim, end quote. In the case of Dysphoria, queering involves portraying game creation as an extremely personal process and denying the player the usual agency that they're afforded. Clark cites various examples of queer developers who subvert norms of video game play to inspire questions relating to norms about sexuality in everyday life. So what I want to talk about is how Christine Love's game Digital A Love Story uses a kind of queer structure to reflect on both queer love and the reader text relationship. This is an image early on in the game where the game which restricts the player entirely to the interface of a computer from 1988 is asking you to dial a local number to connect to a bulletin board system where the player can then communicate on messaging boards. Uh, so as the game progresses, the player communicates back and forth with a person named Emilia. Her name is indicated with an asterisk. So the player and Emilia grow closer and express reciprocal love until she is murdered by a virus that targets artificial intelligences, revealing her status as a computer program. So after having to be recompiled on the player's personal interface, she sacrifices herself by having the player run a program to destroy that same virus, saving the other AIs, and ending the game. So as I said before, Love uses a computer screen for the interface of the entire game. There's no meta elements such as the reflection of the user, indicating that the screen occupies a space outside of the player's computer. So Love here is replicating the Amiga Workbench 1.3, a version of the operating system that came with the Amiga 1000 computer upon its release in 1985. So the game is performing this historical project of instructing new users as to the operation of old computers by providing an interface where they can interact with an old computer without having to perform exactly the same labor as someone from the 1980s would have had to have done. So we see here now an image from later in the game where Amelia is expressing her inability to express love for the player. She indicates that love is a new emotion for her, highlighting the socialized quality of love and its often heteronormative basis. As an AI, she has to learn how to love because her non-human status positions her as something that is not inherently capable of love. So her expression of love becomes an essential expression of her humanness as well. The question, is my love wrong, emphasizes the fraught quality of the relationship between Emilia and the player. So their love manifests expressions that are non-normative. They can't express their love in a way that would be socially acceptable in a public environment. But if the player believes Emilia to be human at this point, which is what the game asks, the question kind of takes on a different connotation. In that case, she seems to the player to have never experienced the human intimacy that is commonly associated with love. Having experienced face-to-face -face interactions without experiencing love, she finally finds it with the player through a purely computerized interaction. But learning that Amelia is an AI recontextualizes the novelty of the player's love for her because her entire existence consists of computerized interactions. 
So by questioning face-to-face -face interaction as a prerequisite for love, the game provides an avenue for a computerized entity to experience a love that occurs only through text, the text as capable of producing these erotic sites without engineering the typical social relations of romantic love. The next image here shows one of Emilia's final messages to the player, where she explains a way for her to destroy the virus that is killing AIs in the game, but that would require her to be destroyed in the process. So here, Emilia acknowledges that her liveness, both in her origin and on the in-game computer, depends on the intentional acts of other people. Her ability to be resuscitated renders her non-human, subverting the typically singular events of coming into life and death. But where the previous instances of life and death were beyond her control, Emilia demands that the player enable her final sacrifice to save her brother. So after she sends the player the program that will kill her, they could immediately run it and end the game but they could also not. So the continuation of the game at this point depends on the player's choice to continue sending replies to Emilia, either to prolong the game for its own sake or to find an alternative to her sacrifice. Either way, the player's choice to send additional replies kind of translates as emotional attachment to Emilia in the game as the in-game representation of the player doesn't possess the metatextual awareness of the actual player. And after a certain number of replies, Emilia explains that she has made her decision and that she will no longer reply to the player's messages. So as a fictional computer program within an actual computer program, Emilia obeys a narrative logic that drives the game toward its endpoint. However, her death also underlines the triumph of a familial love, a kind of solidarity, over romantic love. So Christine Love's game makes apparent the emotional discomforts of queer existence, both by evoking the slowness of 1980s computer usage and in its depiction of a, a tragic and queer relationship between a human and a computer program. If the game could be said to have any goal, perhaps it would be to induce an emotion in the player that's concentrated on Emilia, even though she is a computer program. Despite the seemingly de-eroticized quality of the game's interface and its language, there are many opportunities for pleasure and the exploitation of the interface's communication channels and the developing relationship with Emilia. But regardless, love produces a scenario where successfully completing the game is predicated upon the failure to continue the relationship, denying the player a sense of fulfillment. So this video game presents a contradictory scenario where the player becomes affectively linked to the computer, extending beyond the boundaries of their body, but they brush up against discomforts due to the aspects of the relationship that are deemed impossible. So in that way, people as varied as Christine Love, queer theorists, video game scholars, gesture toward how queer relationships inherently go against certain norms of space and time, resulting in this antagonistic force that might ultimately cause despair and dissatisfaction because of the way it moves against normative relations. So the question then arises as to how affect can be mobilized as a political force inside and outside video games to advocate for queer love as a force. Thank you for listening.
Hi everyone, my name is Derek Mason and I'm an Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary. I want to acknowledge that I'm putting this presentation together on Treaty 7 territory in Southern Alberta, which is the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy and is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. My talk today is entitled How to Fail at Caper in the Castro, Gaming, Young Adult Literature, and HIV AIDS. And this talk is essentially an abbreviated version of a chapter I have in my forthcoming book, uh, which is coming out next year from the University Press of Mississippi called Queer Anxieties of Young Adult Literature and Culture. And what I do in this book is offer something of a critical history of the young adult genre when it comes to queer representation. Each chapter looks at a different site of anxiety, that is a particular theme that has caused critics no small amount of anxiety over the years. And as you can imagine, HIV AIDS has a long history of myths and underrepresentation in young adult literature, and it has generated a fair amount of anxious criticism. So in this chapter, I look at the first ever queer video game, Caper in the Castro, and think of it as something of an affective map to conversations about HIV AIDS and its relationship to young adult literature. I look in particular at the concept of failure and the affect that surrounds failure in both Caper in the Castro and young adult literature. So this is essentially the gist of my talk here today. I'm going to uh, provide an excerpt from this chapter. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. And once again, this is How to Fail at Caper in the Castro, Gaming, Young Adult Literature, and HIV AIDS. So before I jump in here, I just wanted to provide a bit of additional information on the history of how young adult literature has mis- and underrepresented HIV AIDS. There were only four novels in the 1980s and 13 in the 1990s uh, that dealt with HIV AIDS. And of those novels, only one featured a young HIV positive character. Generally speaking, young adult literature offers inaccurate explanations for HIV transmission and unreasonable fears dominate the reasons why protagonists fear HIV AIDS. This is coming from Gross, Goldsmith and Carruth's study on the topic. Most characters with HIV AIDS are dead or dying despite treatment advances. Only marginal characters tend to be affected by HIV AIDS and novels featuring HIV positive young people are typically set in Africa or Papua New Guinea. Moreover, there's been no significant study on HIV AIDS in young adult literature since Gross et al. published their annotated bibliography in 2010. I did an informal, very brief study with one of my research assistants, and we found that there were only eight young adult titles published from 2015 to 2019 that deal directly with HIV AIDS. And of those titles, six are set in the 1980s or 90s. And of the two titles set in the contemporary era, only one has a young HIV positive protagonist and the other is about an HIV positive father. So really when it comes down to it, young adult literature continues to represent HIV as a historical issue that is mostly detached from the lives of young people. So despite what young adult literature seems to suggest, HIV AIDS continues to be a very real part of the lived experience of many young people. In 2017, youth aged 13 to 24 made up 21% or over 8,000 of the over 38,000 new HIV diagnoses in the U.S., and HIV positive youth are, and this is taken from the CDC website, are the least likely of any age group to be linked to care in a timely manner and have a suppressed viral load. So here we can see how young adult literature is in direct conflict with the realities surrounding HIV AIDS and young people. So now that I've provided that general background, I'm going to jump into my analysis of Caper in the Castro. On December 20th, 2017, a Vice headline announced that you can now play the first LGBTQ computer game for the first time. Indeed, the long-lost Caper in the Castro, a gay and lesbian-based adventure mystery game with sound, text, and graphics, released by C.M. Ralph in May 1989, had been recovered by its creator and restored with the assistance of the LGBTQ game archive. Castro invites players to assume the role of private detective Tracker McDyke and solve a series of puzzles. Who kidnapped Tessie LaFemme, renowned drag queen, and what is Dulligan Straight Man, notorious villain, really up to? 
Following its initial release, Ralph described Castro as charity wear and requested that players make a donation to any AIDS charity of your choice in any amount. Ralph explained in an interview that she, quote, wanted to do something for the LGBT community that had embraced her and her partner while also honoring the nearly 90% of their Southern California friends who had died from AIDS-related illnesses. Caper in the Castro's plot is compelling. As the gamer, playing as Tracker McDyke, investigates Tessie LaFemme's disappearance, a larger conspiracy unfolds. Notorious villain Dulligan Straightman is plotting to poison gay bar drinks with lethal bacteria. The game's goal gradually becomes twofold as players discover that, in addition to rescuing Tessie from their captor, they must neutralize the bacteria that is intended to eliminate the Castro's queer community. Although AIDS itself is never named in the game, except on the title screen under the charity wear call for donations, the thematic resonances with HIV AIDS are undeniable. At one point, should players choose to consume the wine available in a venue called Club 102, Castro delivers the message, the house wine has been tainted with a deadly, fast-acting bacterial virus. You are about to die, and there is no antidote. Sorry. Despite Castro's tongue-in-cheek humor and playful tone, it is challenging to not feel the affective weight of HIV-AIDS in this game, which was created in the midst of a health crisis that was being disavowed by the Reagan and Bush administrations, and which asked players to uncover straight man's conspiracy to murder vast numbers of queers by unleashing a bacterial virus. And of course, since bacteria and viruses are distinct, there's no such thing as a bacterial virus. Um, the house wine death message is the only instance in the game where the lethal substance is referred to as a virus. Otherwise, it is, is called a bacteria. Uh, but the virus mention only further strengthens the game's resonances with HIV. In her book, Playing with Feelings, Aubrey Annable argues that video games are affective systems. When we open a video game program, Annabelle continues, we are opening up a form of relation to the game's aesthetic and narrative properties, the computational operations of the software, the mechanical and material properties of the hardware on which we play the game, ideas of leisure and play, ideas of labor, our bodies, other players, and the whole host of fraught cultural meanings and implications that circulate around video games. In the longer book chapter itself, I think through the way that playing Castro today might make us feel about the past and present of HIV AIDS. Castro invites us into an affective system in which we feel the entanglements of dated gaming technology, specifically a point and click hypercard interface and low resolution black and white graphics, a queer mystery involving a deadly threat that is not HIV yet strongly recalls HIV, the history of HIV AIDS and the ghosts of those lost to the epidemic, and our embodied present-day selves playing and failing to play a glitchy 30-year-old game through a web browser-based emulator. As Annabel writes, video games draw us into a, quote, circuit of feeling between their computational systems and the broader systems with which they interface, ideology, narrative, aesthetics, and flesh, end quote. Notably, I argue, Castro allows us to play with and feel some of the anxieties that circulate around and within young adult literature about HIV AIDS. Young adult literature, as I've already outlined, tends to represent HIV AIDS as simultaneously everywhere and nowhere, a looming threat that nonetheless typically leaves young protagonists untouched. HIV AIDS is a ghostly presence that is disavowed and ubiquitous, one from which young adult literature attempts to distance its young characters in order to preserve their innocence. Typically, young adult characters affected by HIV AIDS are parents, uncles, or strangers, not the young protagonists themselves. HIV AIDS is also often portrayed as a historical issue that has little to no bearing on present day life. Young adult literature generally does not, in other words, represent HIV AIDS as an ongoing part of young people's lives. A young adult novel published in 2013, David Levithan's Two Boys Kissing, illustrates this temporal chasm with noteworthy clarity, and for the sake of time I've omitted much of my lengthy analysis of this novel uh, from this video in favor of a more sustained focus on the video game, but you can definitely read more about this analysis in my book. 
Two Boys Kissing, set in the present day, is narrated by a ghostly chorus of men called the Shadow Uncles, who died during the worst of the HIV-AIDS crisis in the 1980s and 90s. This chorus struggles and continually fails to intervene in the lives of the book's young protagonists. The past, in other words, fails to assert itself in the present, in large part because the present refuses to acknowledge the past. Failure is crucial to Two Boys Kissing and Caper in the Castro, and failure has also emerged as a key concept in both video game studies and queer theory. Jesper Jewell argues, for instance, that video games are unique because they let players experience and experiment with failure in ways that other forms do not, and Jack Helberstam has explored how failure allows queers to dodge coercive normative structures and, quote, poke holes in the toxic positivity of contemporary life. Castro sets players up to feel, repeatedly, negative affect typically associated with failure. Powerlessness, frustration, and the sensation of loss. These affective forms clarify some of the critical anxieties about HIV-AIDS in young adult literature, and they might also help us reconcile the history of HIV-AIDS with its persistence in the present. So now on to my experience playing Caper in the Castro. The first time I booted the game, I was excited to start playing. I found the plot synopsis to be witty and captivating, and the screenshots I viewed online filled me with fuzzy nostalgia for the blocky, low-resolution black-and-white graphics and Chicago font endemic to 1980s and 90s Macintosh software. It was thrilling to see overt queer themes and characters housed in such a retro digital environment. The game itself, however, is glitchy and often deeply frustrating to play. Launching Castro through the Internet Archive emulator was its own challenge. Before starting the game, players have to configure the simulated Macintosh desktop to properly produce sound. On several occasions, I was somehow booted from the game into a HyperCard home screen, which required a restart of the emulator. Dialog boxes often contain spelling errors. Players have to type in commands to progress, and the game is unforgiving where the specificity of these occasionally misspelled prompts is concerned. At one critical juncture, for example, which is currently unfolding on the screen before you, the player must misspell shackles, S-H-A-C-K-L-E-S, as S-H-A-K-L-E-S to achieve the appropriate effect. Typing often produces a sticky key effect, where the same letter is unintentionally reproduced multiple times. Yet, the game's most agonizing glitch is that every keystroke produces the correct result except for the hyphen. Whenever I tried to input a hyphen, nothing would happen. Hyphen-free gameplay would typically seem to be a minor issue, except at one point the player must dial a phone number, 922-5489 and unlock a safe combination 64-69-102 in order to receive valuable clues and the game will not accept these entries without hyphens in the appropriate place. I tried playing on my personal Apple laptop, my Apple office computer, an Apple tablet. I conferred with my research assistant, a PC user. I attempted cutting and pasting hyphens from various word processing applications. I experimented with a near infinite number of keyboard shortcuts. All efforts were in vain. And in case my technological aptitude is in doubt, I am not the only gamer to experience this glitch. The game's sole Internet Archive review as of May 2019, the time at which I was working on this piece, read, Honestly, the only problem is I can't finish the game because I can't use the spacebar, hyphen, and the bottom keys on my keyboard are off one letter in the game. I did not experience the first or third issues. And then, of course, months later, once I had finished a draft, another user helpfully provided a workable solution to the hyphen problem. When I was playing, however, I lost my patience. I felt like I was wasting my time. My annoyance was such that I walked away from the game for several weeks. If I couldn't play this game properly, I didn't want to play at all. Eventually, out of desperation, I cheated. A complete playthrough of Castro is available on YouTube, created by a gamer, Puck, who somehow had access to the elusive hyphen. I watched the video until Puck made the phone call, unlocked the safe, and received the clues. I played again, clicking my way through the game. 
I made some headway, I uncovered a dead body, discovered a few more clues, and shot my way through the window into Club 102. There I encountered another annoyingly specific prompt that I just couldn't crack. I abandoned the game again for a while, and then eventually returned to Puck's YouTube video. At this point, I had essentially given up on passing the game myself, so I watched Puck play her way through Castro, liberate Tessie, and destroy the toxic bacteria. I passed the game myself just to have the experience, but it was deeply unsatisfying. I felt like I didn't earn it. Rather, I was especially frustrated because the glitchy game hadn't permitted me to earn the satisfaction of passing it myself. It denied me the pleasure of a fair victory. In The Art of Failure, Jewel suggests that video games' uniqueness lies in how they allow us to play with the sensation of failing, to, quote, experience and experiment with failure. Whereas we tend to avoid failure in real life, Jewel argues, we often pursue failure when playing a video game because through failure we learn, adapt, and approach success. In fact, Jewel claims, the more we fail at a game, the more satisfying will be our eventual victory. Good video games, therefore, set us up for repeated failure, but also, quote, promise us a fair chance of redeeming ourselves, end quote. What Jewel describes, however, is a kind of deliberate, intentionally programmed failure, unlike what I experienced while playing Castro. While I certainly fell into a number of traps purposefully set up by the game, my most substantial and frustrating pathways to failure were through the game's glitches. Jewel writes, When we dislike feeling responsible for failure, we dislike even more strongly games in which we do not feel responsible for failure. This is precisely why I disliked Castro the first few times I played it. It refused me the agency to overcome my failures and complete the game on my own terms. In fact, it denied me the opportunity to pass the game at all without what I understood to be cheating. Technically, I succeeded, but I still felt like I had failed. In Playing with Feelings, Annabel asks, how can a video game affectively reorient us toward history? Castro offers its version of HIV-AIDS, Straitman's bacterial virus, as a mystery to be solved by the player, but the resolution of this mystery is severely impeded by a series of glitches. When I attempted to win Castro, but instead died and failed over and over again because the game unfairly refused me the chance to succeed, I felt the embodied affective effects of failure. Of course, the simulated deaths and failures I encountered in Castro are far from equivalent to the countless real lives lost to AIDS, yet by repeatedly compelling players to fail, Castro opens us into an affective circuit where we as players might feel the present-day endurance of historical failures and feel those failures embodied as our own. As Halberstam suggests in The Queer Art of Failure, the negative affect associated with failure, quote, disturbs the supposedly clean boundaries between winners and losers, end quote. Such feelings reframe success in the context of this game and asked us to consider what winning might even look or feel like if winning is even possible or desirable. And here's just one brief example from Two Boys Kissing, in which the ghostly chorus evinces feelings similar to the ones that I would argue are cultivated when playing Caper in the Castro. The ghostly chorus lacks the agency to intervene in the present, failing over and over again to prevent ongoing violence and suicide amongst queer youth who must themselves die over and over again. And here's a scene where the ghostly chorus laments its inability to save a young protagonist named Cooper. Why must we die over and over again? Cooper lifts himself into the air. Here we are, thousands of us shouting no, shouting at him to stop, crying out and making a net of our bodies, trying to come between him and the water. Even though we know, we always know that no matter how tight a net we make, no matter how hard we try, he will still fall through. We die over and over again, over and over again. Playing Castro today, this equation is flipped as we present-day players fail over and over again to successfully engage with this historical object and handily solve its mystery. Castro obliges us to feel the affective weight, the frustration, the hopelessness of those failures represented in Two Boys Kissing. 
the failure of the present to properly mourn the past and recognize the ongoingness of HIV AIDS and the consequential failure of the past to have any authority over the present. In her final chapter, Annabel invites us to consider the social possibilities that might emerge from failing at video games. She asks, what if through video games the feelings associated with failure were put to different ends? Might that experience have some affective and socio-technological significance that extends beyond the context of our play? Annabel argues that games offering an aesthetic of failure ask us to feel failure differently. Not quite sit and accept failure, but more to flail with failure. She looks specifically at games that require unconventional and difficult bodily movements, phone apps that require unusual manipulations of the device, for instance. Such ostensibly non-productive gestures, quote, in relation to machines designed for the more orderly and smooth operations of immaterial labor, might reverse the individualization of failure and deflect it back onto the failings of larger systems, end quote. Castro only requires standard use of a mouse and keyboard to navigate its point-and-click-based environment, nothing too atypical. Yet, the frustrating failures it nonetheless compels returns us to the broader socio-political failures I've already outlined. Following Annabel, I ask, where else might these fails and flails take us? In order to pass Castro and at least partially overcome my many failures, I naturally turned to the internet, something that would have been much more difficult when Castro was initially circulating. I could not solve the game in isolation. I had to move from HyperCard, the Macintosh software Ralph used to build Castro, to the World Wide Web, which HyperCard paved the way for. In other words, I had to become part of a network of techs and people brought together by Castro. Puck, the online gamer, the LGBTQ video game archive, and various articles about and interviews with C.M. Ralph, one of which provides the shackles tip. As does Wreck-It Ralph in Halberstam's reading of the video game-inspired Disney film, I found an alternative path through the game, quote, by virtue of a glitch, end quote. Castro denied me a hyphen, the symbol used to join words and numbers, but it asked me to join and connect myself elsewhere and through other means. This aligns with uh, C.M. Ralph's original motivation for designing the game, to pay homage to her queer family and to raise money in support of people living with and dying from HIV and AIDS. At its core, Castro is a game for and about community. In conclusion, as Jack Halberstam suggests in a conversation with Jesper Jewell, quote, maybe we can think of some more complex reasons to design games where the only outcome is losing, end quote. Like Castro, such games might invite us to dwell and flail with failure instead of racing forward to ostensible victory. Such nonlinear lingerings might recall the sideways temporality theorized by Catherine Bond Stockton in The Queer Child. Castro opposes linear temporality through the many failures it induces. Castro's playability, however, presents the temporality of sideways growth as a ludological structure. It offers us, that is, the opportunity to play with and feel sideways temporality as it emerges through failure. Indeed, by making players feel and endure failure over and over and over and over again, Castro points us to new networks and connections while challenging us to re-examine how we feel about and understand winning and losing in the context of broader social and cultural structures. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I certainly enjoyed putting it together. Once again, I'd like to give a huge thanks to the organizers of QGCon for all of their work and for allowing me to participate. I look forward to any conversations that we might have surrounding this presentation. And if you'd like more information or if you'd like to get in touch, you can find me on Twitter at PHDarrett uh, or via my website, which is darrettmason.com. Thanks so much for joining me here today, and I wish you all the best.